so if you don't mind, uh, guys, let me start uh, from our guests uh, um, who are with us uh, here in Sopot. And the question seems too obvious, Marie. I'm looking to you because the first question is to you. Uh, how will regulation and changes related to the Green Deal will affect, let's say, France trade relation with, uh, with uh, third countries? Thank you very much. Dziękuję bardzo za zaproszenie. Uh, thank you for your question and thank you for the, this invitation. Um, I will change a little bit what I wanted to say, uh, and it's uh, thanks to Mr. Peter Schmidt, who was uh, speaking about a holistic approach. And I think that the Green Deal is actually a holistic approach and that we need a holistic approach. So I completely agree with Mr. Schmidt. Um, Green Deal is also uh, a way to meet uh, our consumers' demand. Uh, they ask for more quality, for more food safety, and um, you were asking uh, in which way it will affect our trade. I think that uh, it's, it's also important for our consumer that our imported product meets the same standards also, because uh, we, we are open to trade, and uh, we are happy that with the Green Deal, we will be able to provide more quality products for our clients. We already have a high standard production and it will be even higher. Uh, but also our, our consumers would like um, good quality products in the EU. So it will be something that we will have to, to work on with our partners through WTO or trade agreement that we already have with some partners abroad and uh, going to a more to a higher way of production more uh, sustainable and more environmentally friendly also thank you and uh, what do you think peter uh, peter Michael heller th this is the question to you because i would like to uh, to ask you peter could you provide your view on the green deal uh, its uh, main challenge i guess uh, and, and try to point your possibilities that your sector could grab and turn into an advantage Yes, hello, and again, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I represent uh, the Danish Agriculture and Food Council, which is a private uh, sector representing the Danish farmers and the Danish uh, food companies. So we are very much in uh, to the work with the Green Deal and, and do have a lot of uh, uh, opinions about uh, this um, framework. So uh, in general, we think that it's uh, very good and very ambitious, um, but we actually underline always that it is a growth uh, pact and that it should also take uh, into account uh, the ability to produce and to maintain production in, uh, in uh, our countries as a farmer community. So uh, basically, it's very important for us that, that we see uh, cooperation and support. We are not in it alone, you could say, but we, we definitely support it. Um, and then to, to really cut it short, uh, I think that the main challenge here for us is that if we see a lot of increased costs um, uh, sort of uh, stemming from the Green Deal regulation and what will come out of uh, the Green Deal and especially the farm to fork strategy, then it will be uh, very difficult because it just adds on top of of the uh, inputs that are already at this stage uh, quite expensive for our sector. And that might lead to a uh, loss of competitiveness and also to leakage, meaning that producers, investors will invest outside, uh, outside the EU in countries with less regulation. And that definitely does not benefit the environment or the climate or sustainability in, in general. So uh, with that as a basis, I still think that we uh, look very much into uh, taking part in this, but also to use the potentials, which are then actually uh, things like we might see an increased demand for climate friendly uh, technologies and processing solutions. We definitely can uh, contribute to that part. Uh, then I think also our companies ha have already worked uh, a long time with uh, certification, uh, documentation of compliance, etc. So this new area of green transformation will be sort of, well, something new, but 
not really because we 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 have tried this traditionally to adapt to new uh, frameworks um so just to give you these uh, few examples that that we definitely uh, uh, think it's a very interesting area and uh, and uh, for sure very important to handle we have to do it together and we also see some some possibilities within this framework thanks Mm, Peter, thank you for, for, for your point of view, and I would like to underline, which is uh, very important, I think, uh, that your point of view is not, uh, let's say, a governmental point of view, official, but uh, the point of view of, of co private companies, agriculture, yeah, isn't it? Correct, absolutely. We are a private organization and we represent the, 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 uh, the private industry, the private uh, farming community, yes. Yeah. Uh, Peter Friedman. We are neighbors. Uh, German uh, is watching very carefully what Poland is doing uh, in terms of Green Deal and of course Poland is watching carefully what German is doing. So how will regulation and changes related to the Green Deal affect German trade relations? Dziękuję za zaproszenie. Też. Możemy rozmawiać po polsku. No, 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 no. Unfortunately <laughs> not. Because Peter knows Polish very well, I guess. Yes, I do. I understand, but the talking is a little bit different. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it was quite interesting to prepare for this meeting because I involved quite some people in our ministry to find answers on your question. And there was actually a lot of thinking. What does it mean for, for trade? And uh, of course, people reminded me that we that what we talk about here is a bit difficult because we don't know the concrete measures and the concrete measures will decide on each sector what it means for productability. Uh, it, it also depends on each product, how compatible it is, if it, if it will be more affected by the Green Deal or not. But okay, having, having said that, we came to the conclusion within the ministry that looking at the German uh, sectors, the challenges will be the biggest in the livestock area, uh, we, we, we feel, of the Green Deal, uh, which is natural because it is a very CO2 intensive uh, sector. It produces a lot of organic uh, waste, which leads to uh, surplus of nutrition. Uh, you may know that in, in, the, in some parts of West Germany, we have a, have a quite a big problem with uh, nitrate in the water, in the groundwater. So we, we feel very, already very much what, what it means in, to have an intensive livestock production. And what are the extra costs uh, Mr. Schmidt talked about? This is one of the external costs, for example, the cleaning of the water in some areas I told areas you that your, your speech was really inspiring. No, but this is something which is very noticeable in some parts of Germany yeah. because we have to invest a lot of money to take the nitrate out of the water that comes in through the manure of uh, animals. Okay, so it's a, it's a livestock uh, sector which, which will be challenged also by the uh, target of antibiotics. We talk about 25 million pigs in Germany that need antibiotics, that will be a challenge. I mean, they still will get antibiotics. 25 million? We have 25 million pigs in Germany, just to give you a number. Huh? We have, I think we have the most intensive uh, livestock, uh, if it comes to a pig at least. Poland, I guess, has about 10 million. Okay. And they're all centered in, uh, not all, well, but mainly centered in some one re region in the northeast. So that is really causing some problems there, let's say. So this is something we have to face anyway. Uh, then, naturally, I think there's a challenge for special crops uh, that are highly dependent on pesticides like uh, or, um, fruits, wine, and hop, I learned. Hop is very dependent on uh, pesticides. And uh, here, it is very important uh, from the German perspective that the use of pesticides will be harmonized completely. So there will be no distortion of, uh, of the competition in the future uh, if it comes to the use of pesticides. Uh, of course, we uh, see or we, we predict a reduction of production in the EU. We see higher producing costs. We see more imports, less exports. Um, I think this is something which will be hard to, to, to deny. Uh, the question then again for each sector is how, how compatible it is and how much it will really be affected by the changes. For example, if you're looking at hop, we don't see... After the changes. 
Yeah, we hop. We don't see a big change because I was told hop is there's a high demand for German hop. So even when it gets more expensive to produce it, it will be still there. So okay. So we have to see. Yeah, uh, Caroline. Uh, the question to you, what steps your country is, uh, is taking towards a zero carbon economy and food and agri sector? Um, well, first of all, at the moment already in the Netherlands, the agricultural sector has one of the lowest CO2 footprint. Uh, if you look at the kilogram of produced food, and that goes especially for the horticultural sector for arable farms as well. Uh, but where we do see the challenge and where we are working on is in the livestock sector, uh, which also was mentioned by Friedemann. Uh, we have in the Netherlands about 10 to 12 million pigs, uh, but we are a much smaller country than Poland is or than Germany is. So we can see the impact on the environment specifically in that sector. And the Dutch government uh, just two weeks ago, they announced that they're going to make 6.8 billion euros available. Uh, for the transition into energy as well, sustainable energy, but also into the transformation of the agricultural sector. So we have there a vision of circular agriculture and we're working there together with all the stakeholders to become even more sustainable. Okay. Uh, you want us to add something? Someone uh, did provoke you to the response now? Okay, so, so my, second, uh, my next question is to, to all of you, because I would like to ask if you had to choose one important challenge, one imp the most important challenge related to the Green Deal, what would it be? Marie. Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> Thank you for asking me first. <laughs> maybe not one, so maybe not, maybe not one. The, the, the most important challenges. Um, well, um, I, I will make also, again, a link with Mr. Schmidt's uh, presentation. As you say, very inspiring. Uh, you were um, referring as the fact that we are surrounding with we, we are invited by a bank so here in the in this room there are economics finance specialists and and the, the future the, the one of the challenge that we will face it's uh, going towards more precise agriculture innovation and and investment money so CAP is here to to help and support farmers but uh, the state cannot provide everything and we will need uh, banks finance uh, private sector to help to support uh, our agricultural sector to go more in a green in a more sustainable direction so so that that is one, one challenge that we will face is uh, having more finance uh, for green project and also insurance for our farmers because with the climate change there are more and more uh, climate uh, phenomenon that can affect agriculture so that's also uh, another another part of um, of the challenge uh, and I wanted also to to add that I, I agree with my colleagues the reducing of antibiotics and pesticides is definitely a challenge for everyone and it's it is linked also with this uh, question of innovation uh, I was mentioning okay, Peter. Yeah, it's also a bit difficult because uh, <laughs> so many areas, I, of I know. course I'm an expert, but, uh, but then again, uh, also not 100% maybe. Uh, well, no, but from preparing for this meeting, I, I learned that uh, the animal husbandry, livestock, is, is not only the problem of CO2, it's the largest emitter of laughing gas and methane. So I think we can do a lot about pesticides, but I... I think, or I don't really see how we can get this problem uh, solved. I mean, because I, what I read in some preparation documents I received is that we have to change uh, also the species. You know, I don't know, there's a lot of uh, science involved in this, but we have to find a way that cows don't emit uh, so much methane. I, I don't know how that can be done. I'm not a scientist, unfortunately, but that seems for me really the big challenge. Yeah. You, I, you, I, I you mentioned know. reducing pesticides many times. So, so what, what, what's the, the most difficult in this area, in your opinion? The pesticide, as I mentioned, it, it will be very difficult for, for fruit, uh, uh, hops and wine, but there the German answer would be innovation, smart farming. That, that's the official answer, let's say, from my ministry to this, this problem. Uh, if it will really And we would job, like to ask uh, for a non-official answer. <laughs> 
Personally, I would say it will help, but it costs a lot of money. Who will pay for it? Yeah, exactly. And will it really do the job? Because I also learned in the preparation of this meeting that 40% of harvest worldwide are destroyed by um, plant uh, parasites, plant parasites. So, so yes, there is a, clearly a need for pesticides. Uh, in, the, in the last years, the consumption of pesticides in Germany went down because of the very dry weather, but uh, that can immediately change. Once again, I'm, from my profession as a lawyer, I, I don't really want to go into this. Okay, so let's, let's, it. let's jump to the, uh, Denmark, uh, because I would like to ask the same question, Peter Michael Heller. Yes, I mean, I can fully uh, agree with what uh, my, my um, co-panelists here say and point to. I mean, uh, especially the, the cooperation with the knowledge institutions will be so important uh, to reach the goals of, of this Green Deal. Uh, we, at this stage, don't even know how to get to the uh, proposed reductions and to climate neutrality. So there's definitely um, a need for uh, engaging in, in the cooperation and also to, to find the financial measures to, to support that development. So I think it's quite remarkable that, that uh, where we are now, we cannot even point to which uh, technologies we think will actually uh, sum up to, to full neutrality. Uh, and then uh, on sort of the same side, uh, I think we need to have um, some specific tools pointed out uh, that we can use to get uh, to this, uh, to this uh, point um, and to reach the goals of the Green Deal. For instance, the, the uh, new breeding techniques is, some, is an area of high potential, uh, but we still need uh, sort of the license and the acceptance um, to use these new, uh, new breeding techniques such as CRISPR. Uh, I think that could, uh, could bring us a long way and then I also fully agree with the point uh, mentioned uh, by the German representative, I think it was, that um, we definitely need to have sort of market-driven approach. So it's not really uh, a small uh, group of, of, of people, let's say, in Brussels who decide what, uh, what way should we go. Actually, when we talk about food products here, I think it's very important to have uh, the, the consumers to, to show uh, by their choices what is it that they want and and uh, that way around we can via the market mechanisms we can we can uh, we can reach the goal of course at, uh, so supplemented by some legislative uh, um, sort of uh, proposals and systems but it is uh, to be a, a market driven system thank you peter uh, caroline uh, if you had to choose one or two or three important changes what would it be uh, well, maybe first in reaction to Friedemann, uh, because we in the Netherlands are dealing also with the reduction of, uh, of methane uh, emissions as well. And we have found that if you change actually the feed of the cows, you can reduce the amount of methane that is being emissioned. So these are the types of measures that are already being taken in the Netherlands. And in addition, indeed, with innovative techniques, also in arable farming, it's not only about innovations, about techniques, but also in a different way of producing. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a farm of the future, and they are, for example, also testing with strip cropping. So that specific parasites, which might be on one crop, uh, are actually being fought by animals or specific insects, which are on the other crop. So it doesn't necessarily need to be very innovative techniques like robotization, but also by a different way of cultivating the soil. But I think the biggest challenge will be, uh, as also the representative Peter from Denmark was telling, will be the consumers actually. Uh, I don't think the biggest challenge is maybe for the farmers. Because in the Netherlands, we just recently had a research uh, that consumers are not still not willing to pay a lot of money extra for sustainable food. And I know that uh, later on, you will also have the representative for the agricultural sustainable uh, production in, uh, in Poland, ASAP. Um, and they have also made a report about sustainable food. And it's very difficult to get, the, to get the consumers on board on that, to have them pay extra for all the things extra that the farmers are, are doing to, uh, to, uh, to contribute to, to a better climate. So for me, the biggest challenge would be on the consumer side and not as much on the farmer side.
Yeah, thank you, Caroline, very much for underlying this subject because I fully agree that uh, for us the, the most important thing is to change people's mind, people's attitude. Uh, you know, the, the give them uh, uh, enough knowledge. What do you think? What your countries, guys, are doing uh, to, to change the situation, Marie? Well, um, to 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 change the the consumers' view. Well, there, there are public and private initiative uh, on those fields. Um, I wanted to, to take one example, for example, the food waste management, uh, because it's, it's a huge issue, and it's also a huge issue when you think about um, the Green Deal, because uh, if you produce food and you waste it at the end, it's, uh, it's, it's not a sustainable way of, of producing and also of treating food, and that's something uh, France is pushing for five years now. We had a law in France uh, and a lot of initiative to push the consumers uh, toward le less uh, food waste and also more be more aware of the global value of the food because it's not only about uh, not wasting but just uh, as again Mr. Schmidt was saying uh, food is sometimes too cheap maybe or seen too cheap so it's it's important uh, for the consumer to realize that at the end what they are paying for and maybe you can pay a little bit more uh, regarding this and that type of, of um, measure or practice. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually I would like to add that the, the, the problem with the consumer, uh, we have this similar uh, interviews in Germany that consumers say, yes, yes, of course, we want more uh, sustain sustainable agriculture and we are willing to pay for it, but then it doesn't happen. You can see that very nicely in the stock uh, in the in the uh, animal welfare, we, you know that we have a, a private uh, 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 labeling of welfare and we, we introduced four steps of welfare. One is, let's say, the, the legal uh, minimum, uh, two is a little bit more, three is more outside, four, let's say, is bio. And what happened? I mean, we, really, we introduced it everywhere. Uh, people keep sticking to number one, you know. and. Uh, that, that will definitely be a challenge, but I'm glad to hear that the solutions come from the Netherlands and we can <laughs> learn from them. <laughs> uh, maybe the last question, because just in five minutes we have the second panel and I'm going to ask non-EU uh, member states perspective. Don't you think that the one of the biggest challenge will be to come to an agreement with non-EU countries? <laughs> Peter is smiling. Peter uh, Keller. Why are you smiling? <laughs> yes, I'm smiling because I think it's a very relevant uh, topic within this area. And uh, I think actually coming from, from trade policy background myself, I think it is actually very, very important to, to engage with uh, third uh, countries, both for the reasons of, of trade and economic interaction, but also to try to cooperate on, on our goals, our ambitions, because uh, even though the EU is, is big from our perspective, of course, we are not uh, the whole world. So absolutely necessary with cooperation. There is one caveat though, and that is of course that um, we should not have this uh, cooperation lead to some kind of trade war where we actually try to push some standards towards um, other countries um, and where we end up in, 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 in trade disputes. Uh, so I think it, it has to be done in a, in a clever way. Uh, we could uh, like propose to to have these free trade agreements uh, where the EU already has 72 agreements with, with third, uh, third countries. And that way we could try to influence and incentivize uh, also to uh, make sure that the, the goods that we import into the EU uh, have the same level uh, of, of uh, health and, and, uh, and uh, environmental uh, low impact, etc. Uh, but we should do it uh, in this, uh, this clever way. We won't, don't want to be blamed for being protectionist that's um, that's my view yeah Marie, you agree uh, yes I definitely agree and there is a link also with the with the consumer so everything is linked because uh, it's a it's, we have to talk with our partner for third countries to go on. Uh, for example, we are happy that uh, now we have a trade agreement with Canada. I know there is a representative from Canada. Uh, and in this agreement, we have uh, a dialogue on sanitary, phytosanitary issue quite regularly to compare our standards, to 
discuss sometimes can be hard topics, but uh, we are discussing. It's not a trade war. It's a partnership, and we are trying to to reach to one another. So it's important. But we have to bear in mind what our consumer wants, and we know that in Europe, consumers are not ready to accept uh, practices that are um, commonly admitted in other countries, like GMOs, for example. So that that's the whole thing, the whole discussion to have. Yes, a partnership, strong partnerships with our partners, but also respecting their consumers and our consumers' demand and limits. Thank you. And Caroline, last but not least. I completely agree with the previous speakers. And of course, free trade is still beneficial for all of us. Uh, so free trade agreements between the EU and others uh, are valuable. And, but in that said, it's also very important to keep in mind that level playing field. Uh, that we are not at one point consuming here what our farmers are not allowed to produce. Um, and within those free trade agreements, we also need to have a look at, uh, at our export markets. Not all export markets are price driven. If I look, for example, at the free, uh, trade, free trade agreement with Japan, we can also see an increase of dairy products exported to Japan because the Japanese market is more about quality instead of price. So it's also looking at different opportunities. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Peter, Michael Heller. Thank you, Peter Friedman. And thank you, Marie-Christine Legal, for being with us uh, today. It was a pleasure to talk with you. And, and I wish you a, a good day and stay healthy in this difficult time. <laughs> thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.